a good morning to all uh, participants that are joining right now to our webinar. I would like just to mention that uh, we will just wait a couple of minutes to just uh, provide some time to everyone who were planning to join, to be able to join in time, and we will start our webinar in a couple of minutes. Thank you. Okay, let's start with our webinar. I think we can start. We, are, we already see a good number of people already joined us. Uh, today, uh, we would like to uh, talk about uh, climate and how the trade facilitation and paperless trade can contribute to that climate goals. In recent years, we have seen a lot of challenges uh, uh, deriving from the environmental uh, problems the impact and the footprint of human activities are impacting the life of many uh, people around the world in different regions and uh, the environment and the planet is uh, having a lot of challenges and those challenges are facing also uh, different regions uh, from the different countries uh, and uh, this is where the different uh, sectors and industries are thinking how they can actually um, align their activities to ensure that the climate goals are achieved. Uh, therefore, we have decided to talk about, uh, about the trade facilitation. As you know, our webinar is focusing on the accelerating trade uh, through the digitalization of the trade procedures, uh, transactions of the cross-border trade. And today we would like to hear, uh, we have uh, asked a lot of experts from different sectors, from public sector, from private sector, involved in the international supply chain. Uh, and what are the activities, what are the practices and standards from the international organizations that are, that are focusing to impact positively uh, the environmental goals. Therefore, without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, the uh, opening remarks panel speakers, uh, starting with Ian Duval, Chief Trade Policy and Facilitation Section, uh, Trade Investment and Innovation Division of ESCAP. After we will hear from Ms. Sandra Hani, uh, she is the Global Policy Lead for the Climate in the International Chamber of Commerce. And uh, later we will have Mr. Brendan O'Neill from the WCO, Deputy Director of Procedures and Facilitation, and uh, last but not least, Mr. Kijin Kim, Senior Economist for the Asian Development Bank. I would like now to ask my colleague to start with the pre-recording videos for the uh, intervention, for the opening remarks. And later we will continue with our sessions where we will have excellent speakers from international organizations and private sector and also public sector talking about uh, case studies and also about the standards that uh, may help uh, to facilitate cross-border trade and how those uh, trade facilitation measures may impact positively the environmental goals. Please, Anok, go with the pre-recording videos. Thank you. On behalf of UNESCO, a very warm welcome to all participants and panelists for the 14th webinar in our joint series with ICC and ADP on accelerating cross-border paperless trade. The series has now reached well over 2,500 participants since it was launched, and you're welcome to access recordings of all previous webinars from our website. Today's webinars, again in collaboration with the World Customs Organization, 
focuses on climate smart trade facilitation and specifically on the role paperless trade implementation can play in achieving sustainable development goal number 13 on climate action. ESCAP is no stranger to this topic. Uh, we actually try to calculate the potential benefit from switching from paper-based trade documentations to paperless trade processes a few years ago. Uh, two of the insights from that work was that uh, first, uh, moving to paperless trade could save CO2 emissions globally, uh, equivalent to uh, planting about a billion trees, so quite significant. And second, uh, that most of the reduction in emissions would be associated not with the reduced use of paper or the ink, but really with the increased inefficiency associated with having all the data and documents in electronic form. So a study on electronic single window implementation by Antad uh, in Vanuatu uh, also uh, pointed to uh, reduction, reduction in emissions. If you're interested, uh, I recommend you take a look online at the flagship publication on climate smart trade investment we launched uh, together with Antad and UNEP at the WTO uh, back in 2021. What we also uh, found uh, when doing this work is that it was very complex uh, to quantify and fully grasp the environmental benefits associated with trade digitalization or in fact any other process. Uh, there is still a lot of data missing and, and much more research and effort um, are required in, in this area. As such, I'm very pleased uh, today to see our 14th webinar in the series dedicated uh, to this topic. Uh, let me thank all the experts from both the public and private sector that will share their insights uh, on this uh, important topic today and, and really very much uh, looking forward to doing further work together uh, in this area beyond this uh, webinar. Thank you very much. The International Chamber of Commerce as the institutional representative of 45 million companies in over 150 countries holds a deep commitment to the Paris Climate Agreement. In our centenary declaration, we committed to drive sustainability and mobilize business for the 1.5 degree ambition. Since the early 90s, we have been the official focal point for business and industry to the UNFCCC, the UN Framework Convention for Climate Change. In this role, we act as a bridge between policymakers, business, innovators and investors to help deploy and implement solutions for climate faster. The science is crystal clear. Without urgent and concerted global action, we will miss a rapidly closing window to tackle the climate crisis and prevent the most dramatic impacts on planet and people. As global efforts shift towards building a net zero economy, we are just at the beginning to understand what this means for trade and the facilitation of goods and services across supply chains that have significant impact on global GHG emissions. New climate policy are being developed at fast pace. These will not only affect trade, they will also lead to new demands for border agencies to ensure compliance and tracing. Digital trade facilitation and deployment of fast track procedures related to control, inspection and clearance will become even more important. We have seen some progress on this front in recent months, but simply not enough. It is often inadequate legal frameworks and the lack of legislative reforms that hold back the adoption of digital trade solutions. We see the following three key areas for immediate action. First, we call on governments to come together to create the enabling legal environment for the use of electronic trade documents by building on existing efforts and best practices. Second, public-private collaboration to leverage business expertise and know-how will be critical to accelerate the, the development and deployment of digital solutions. Third, we cannot forget about micro, small and medium-sized enterprises, the linchpin of any economy wide transition to net zero. The needs and challenges of MSMEs, in particular with regards to complex customs and border requirements, need to be considered in the design of necessary re reforms and policy. Let me conclude by emphasizing that the global business community places vital importance to achieve a fully digitalized trade system and stands ready to assist governments and institutions 
to make trade a driver of climate action. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you for joining us for this important webinar on how paperless trade can contribute to climate goals. I am Brendan O'Hearn, the Deputy Director in Charge of Procedures and Facilitation at the World Customs Organization. It's my pleasure to organize this webinar jointly with our partners, the United Nations Economic and Social Commitment for Asia and the Pacific, the International Chamber of Commerce, and the Asia Development Bank. COVID-19 has accelerated the need for digitalization and automation of trade processes. With physical restrictions and social distancing measures in place, the traditional paper-based trade systems have proven to be inefficient and costly. At the same time, climate change remains one of the biggest challenges facing our planet today. As we strive for a more sustainable future, it is imperative that we explore ways to reduce the carbon footprint of trade and logistics operations. In this context, the topic of today's webinar is particularly timely and relevant. The World Customs Organization has recognized the importance of digitalization and the role it can play in enhancing trade efficiency and sustainability. Green customs is a focus area in the WCO strategic plan for 2022 to 2025, with initiatives to support the implementation of environmentally sound policies and practices in the international trade arena. We recognize that it has the potential to contribute to sustainable development, but also to environmental degradation. And it is our responsibility to help ensure that trade supports rather than undermines the achievement of global sustainability goals. The adoption of paperless trade systems can offer a multitude of benefits, including reduced costs, improved speed and accuracy of processing, and lower environmental impact. By minimizing the use of paper, we can reduce the amount of waste generated and decrease the carbon footprint of trade and logistics operations. However, there are challenges that need to be addressed including the need for a secure and reliable digital infrastructure, legal and regulatory frameworks, and capacity building. I look forward to a fruitful webinar with excellent speakers from customs, standard setting organizations, and the private sector who will all share their perspectives as we work towards a more sustainable and resilient trade ecosystem. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our latest webinar on paperless trade. ADB's latest report on economic integration shows that the Asia and the Pacific is one of the most vulnerable regions to climate change risks, yet emits the largest volume of carbon dioxide. Our research shows that CO2 emission intensities in both production and exports are the highest in Asia compared to other, other regions. Moreover, the region's total CO2 emissions from gross exports have risen almost threefold over the last 20 years, although the trajectory has moderated recently. While the region's integration into global value chains has contributed to economic growth and prosperity, it has also led to a rise in CO2 emissions from gross exports. So we believe that effective climate actions require deep international cooperation. If achieved at the regional or global level, digital trade facilitation can play a key role in reducing carbon emissions by increasing transparency, simplifying customs procedures, improving coordination between border agencies, which will lead to a shortening delays at, at the borders, for example. We should also work together to facilitate the interoperability of certification systems, adoption of consistent methodologies in emissions accounting, and mutual recognition agreements on conformity assessments. Bringing down trade barriers in environmental goods can also be enhanced by expanding the list to include emerging technologies and in energy, while also deepening the preferential treatment of these goods. I hope that you will find our discussions today productive and meaningful as we explore how we can work together to tackle the biggest challenge of our time. Thank you for joining us and let's get started. 
Uh, thank you for the speakers for their interventions and for, for from all the organizations that I think have set up the direction of our webinar and the discussions, providing a background of all the topics that we are going to uh, touch during this webinar. And now I would like to uh, give the floor to Christian Lembeke from WCO. A technical attaché from the WCO who is originally from German Customs and who is involved in the trade facilitation WCO data model, reform and modernization monitoring map, and uh, other activities related to the trade digitalization, such as single window and those aspects. Christian, the floor is yours for the first session, please. Thank you very much, Amon. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Um, the first session is dedicated to the global perspective on what, uh, uh, how can paperless trade contribute to climate goals. So I'm happy that we have um, three excellent speakers, two from standard dating um, organizations, UNCFRAC, and from my colleague from the WCO, and one from the global um, trade forward perspective um, from DHL. So if you have any questions to our speakers, please, uh, you can use the Q&A button. You will find it on the bottom on, on Zoom. And we will um, raise these questions after uh, both sessions at the end around uh, 4, 4.10 uh, p.m. Uh, Bangkok time. So without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce our first speaker, which is Mr. Ian Watt. He is uh, the founder and CEO of Next Trade and UNC Fact um, Vice Chair. Uh, please, Ian, what the floor is you? Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm speaking to you from Melbourne, Australia. Um, is the secretary bringing up the slides, please? Thank you. Okay, we've been introduced. Um, I have a fairly broad portfolio at CFACT. I've been involved with CFACT since its incorporation in, back in 2002. Um, next slide, please. This slide is definitely an advertisement. CFACT is running its 40th forum in May, and it's the first forum in three and a half years that will be face-to-face, -face, and uh, registration is most welcome. Thank you. Next slide. So what are we dealing with? Sustainability that we're talking about adds a lot of challenges to the existing actors. Actors have to meet new regulatory requirements, product conformity and sustainability demands of consumers. That's very obvious to us. And product conformity cross-border interoperability was mentioned before. That's becoming critical. It requires the ability to trace and report and monitor information from origin, production and logistics, including conditions, geolocations and, and environmental impacts. And we've got technology today in the Web3 environment to be able to keep track of that and to monitor it. And it needs to be in community across borders between government and private sectors. And ideally, we think that paperless is probably a way forward. Next slide, please. Okay, CFACT addresses a number of things. Obviously, at the top, it's got its own governance policies, the, the terms of reference, the, uh, the program of work, the code of conduct, the IP release, and all that kind of stuff that allows us to run projects in a totally open uh, in pu public environment. There is also then material for the public and policymaker and decision maker people relative to materials, our executive guides, guidelines, and there's a number of reports, there's recommendations, and there's the all important code list recommendations, Blue and Low Code and the others. And then at the more technical level for the private sector and solution providers, there are standards, technical specifications, uh, the repository of uh, terms and component library, and getting down to the technologies of interchange, be they XML or JSON or into the future JSON linked data. Next slide, please. In a big picture situation, CFACT has many customers and many targets. On the left, we see that we've got business subject matters experts, and they work in teams. We've got government representations, we've got external liaison, and we've got technical specialists. And these people all volunteer their time over a long period of time running various projects to produce outcomes. It's all directly related to, ultimately, the sustainable supply chains. We've got, we're putting our target output for policymakers, decision makers, consultants, and, and the software developers. 
and we're in a very open environment and hopefully targeting the sustainable goals and we work closely with and re re leverage the WC3, GS1, schema.org and these other bits and pieces. Next slide, please. Next slide, thank you. Okay, we don't do this on our own. And let's talk in a minute. The, the top part is really all of the public bodies that are out there that are moving this all forward. UNSCAP, UNCTAD, and so forth. And at the bottom are the more probably private sector areas, many of which rely on the standards and recommendations from the public, the public sector above. Next slide, please. Recently, the work by the International Chamber of Commerce, and I was extremely pleased to see this, that table in the middle kind of gives us an indication of which are deemed to be the private sector um, organizations and which are the public. And the private sector invariably leverage a lot of what's in the public space in their standards and recommendations going forward. And a toolkit has been launched and there's work going on on key data elements, on trust environment and so forth, which is going to be released at the end of March. This is a great move forward. It'll hit boardrooms and decision makers and this is all good stuff, I believe. So unit C fact is unique amongst standards development organizations in that it ensures interoperability and harmonizations across the entire international supply chain and all modes of transport. Anyone can participate and is free of charge to use these, these materials. Next slide, please. I'll let you just have a look at this slide here. There's pretty well the objectives and the SDGs that this work addresses. There's the deliverables that are usable in helping us get to trade facilitation and support of uh, sustainable supply chains. There are currently 39 active projects and these will be exercised at that 40th forum going forward. Uh, 1500 experts, we can expect probably three, 300 people at the forum in Geneva in May. And I'll talk about the schedule of plenary sessions in a minute. And the regular bureau calls occur every fortnight. That's the bureau. There's about seven of us working with the secretariat driving this all forward. Next slide, please. Here's the schedule of things that are about happening. I'm talking about that 40th plenary, the, sorry, 40th forum. There'll be another one in Bangkok, which I believe that UNSCAP is assisting very much with, and that's much appreciated. And the plenary, which is really the meeting of the secretariat, the heads of delegation of the member states, the bureau, signs off on the work that's been done in the previous 12 months and publishes out into the, into the public domain for use. Next slide, please. So there are many problems that we have to tackle. One is just getting fair play and nobody fiddling the books, if you like, the greenwashing of statistics and so forth around sustainability. And the other is to put in place, which we're seeing now with Web3 and where we're going, the ability to fully trace things, keep track of that, and to be able to audit that so we can track and trace and audit after the fact. So this should be a big help of not only getting to sustainable supply chains, but keeping them in place. Next slide, please. This may we look a wee bit complex, but CFAC recently released a white paper up on the top left hand corner there of verifiable credentials. So verifiable credentials are identities, decentralized identifiers, credentials that will establish that we have in one country to the other the ability to understand who we're dealing with and the things of fair play. Verifiable credentials are things like certificates and so forth that we can absolutely certain are correct, justifiable, honest, and we can rely on them across that border. The trust anchors is the sort of thing we can get to now with the technologies we have. For instance, if we look at that certificate right down the bottom of that big blue area of my diagram there, instead of having to push that certificate to multiple actors in the supply chain, that certificate could stay at the authorizing body and be found by URL links and used as required. The huge advantage of this is that we can redact data that shouldn't necessarily be fully public in this, this uh, international supply chain movement of data. Next slide, please. There are a number of projects that, that, ex that display what's going on at the moment. The leather and textile uh, sustainability is a well-advanced project run with um, UNECE, uh, UNCFACT involved, GS1 involved. So that's very interesting case studies and moving forward very well. The verifiable credentials, we've had a couple of chats about that on the way through here and the reference data models of the vocabularies so that we understand what we're talking about as we shift data from computer to computer and person to person. Next slide, please. Okay, that's it. That's me done, and thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Iron, um, for uh, um, taking your time to update us with all the ongoing activities and uh, how 
global digital standards for uh, sustainable supply chains uh, can support to climate goals. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, please put it into the Q&A, and I, 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 I'm sure that Ian will have a few minutes at the end uh, to respond to the questions and maybe also can respond in the Q&A. So we, there's a possibility to provide the response uh, directly in the in written form in the Q&A. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is my colleague from the WCO. She is Miss um, um, Valentina Ferraro. She's technical attaché at um, She's technical attaché at uh, the World Customs Organization and joined in January 20, 2019. And she's the lead official in the fields of performance measurement and green customs and co-responsible in other areas such as single window, business continuity, and the same framework of standard. Um, in, her, in her presentation, she will, she will uh, speak about the role of customs. Um, uh, the role of customs and digitalization in facilitation of the green transition. Um, thank you very much. And uh, Valentina, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Christian. I will uh, share my screen now. I think I will be enabled now to do so. Yeah, I think you're able to see my screen now, right? Yes, we can see your screen. Yes. Yes, so actually, good day to all the participants to this webinar and my uh, presentation that has been already introduced by my colleague Christian is going to touch upon these points in order to give you the perspective of customs administration as we talk from the WCO perspective, that is the, um, the Cooperation Council that is uh, uh, representing 185 customs administration across the globe. Before entering into the live discussion about what is the customs role and what is customs doing for green custom transition, I would like to um, introduce you to the context. We have already heard into the introductory remarks several key words about this context that is pressing for us and for all the regulatory agencies at the border in order to tackle different challenges at the moment. Some of these challenges are context environmental challenges or in a broad sense, and they relate to growing volumes of trade, growing volumes of people. This global value chain that we heard in, in the previous uh, interventions as well has an impact on the way we regulate or we control the regulatory requirements at the border, but also we see in the overall environment, uh, this industry 4.0 that is offering several opportunities in terms of disruptive technologies that we hope can also facilitate the, the customs mandate and the way we perform our functions at the border. Of course, among these um, overall uh, trends, uh, we need to mention the pressing challenge of the waste management across the border and the pressing need to tackle the climate uh, mitigation uh, goals. Uh, first of all, let me introduce you to the scope of green customs. What do we mean by green customs? What customs mean? by green customs. In order to do so, we have in the previous, uh, in the last annual survey uh, from the WCO that you can find on the WCO website, we have asked this question to customs for the first time. Now the WCO has a long-standing environmental pro program and we already are participating with other international organizations that are dealing with the green goals. However, for the first time, we asked these questions to customs. And the answer was that the first, the first meaning that customs give to the scope of green customs is generating environmental benefits through di digitalization and paperless procedures. The second uh, area where customs see their role in the field of the green transition is monitoring and enforcing the implementation of the several multilateral environment agreements. Then we also have implementing trade facilitation measures for environmentally friendly goods and overall imp implementing green strategies for customs house operation. We also have 
other uh, qualitative answers that were provided, they relate to the modernization of border processes through innovation in order to improve the detection and interception of prohibited goods, such as on invasive species, cites, and others. But also, Customs mentioned the importance of environmentally responsible and accountability and reporting. Um, in the last June uh, 2022, uh, the World Customs Organization organized the first uh, global, um, global conference on green customs. In this global conference, we have gathered together different stakeholders, both the private sectors and other international organizations and academia. And in these high level meetings, we have, high, we have pointed up several items that are highlighting the challenges and opportunities for customs in the transition on circular economy and green customs. And the first one is a challenge and it, and it is related to the material material use prospect that is expected to increase in the following decades. Also, the number of multilateral environmental agreements and their scope will expand. And as a, as a result, the role of customs in enforcing these environmental regulations will need to increase. Also, we see an increasing trade-related environmental measures. And the circular economy transition where a lot of international organizations but also private sector are moving into a different modalities of making business in this respect we need to monitor the flow of goods in this circular economy model that is quite different we will say it in a different slide later on in this respect we highlight the need of monitoring uh, the, the flows through better transparency, traceability, and visibility of the supply chain at the border. And this relates as well to the classification and the HS codes at the global level, but also what customs can do at the national level, opening a separated sub item of the, of the uh, classification. And lastly, we in the circular economy, we, uh, we acknowledge the need to facilitate environmental compliance for goods entering this reuse, refurbish, remanufacturing loop. There is another point that is very important, that is the need to ensure that we have an attention, a specific attention to the developing countries' perspective in the way they need to adapt in this transition towards green economy. And this requires capacity building and a specific focus on export controls. But most importantly, an enhanced cooperation of customs to customs, customs to business, and customs to other government agencies. Overall, there is a need that was recognized for an effective system of information exchange to make these global value chains more compliant, transparent, and sustainable. I mentioned a little bit about the circular economy. This is to give you an idea of what's happening at the border. There are flows of goods that have changed their directions at a certain point. From waste, we go back to recycling, remanufacturing. All these in the global value chain context means good, these goods, these uh, secondhand goods, these components re-entering into the loop and crossing the borders. So we should be able to monitor these goods, to recognize that first of all. And the previous speakers have mentioned standard already and technical specifications that are going to help us out in this respect. Um, we see um, that the different the level of the WTO, there are several, if we look at the environmental database, we see that there is an increasing number of trade measures that uh, requires customs control. And I, I refer to bans, prohibitions, import quotas, export code quotas, et cetera, as licenses. All this needs to enter into these simplified procedures that we are promoting through the digitalization of trade. Just an example of a project that we are um, the undertaking in Asia Pacific, we have this uh, plastic waste border management project that is involving at the moment eight beneficiary countries in Asia Pacific, 
uh, we will have a presentation as well later on from a colleague from Sri Lanka Customs. Um, and here we noticed that in this complexity of uh, in enforcing the regulation related to hazardous plastic waste and plastic waste flowing across the border, there are several documentation that are as well exchanged and should be integrated into a single window environment to be more effective and efficient. Uh, these, in this case, relate to the prior informed consent procedure under the Basel Convention. Uh, we have uh, updated our, we have several tools at the WCO. I will mention one as an example, uh, the Coordinated Border Management Compendium, where there is a section now related to the Basel Convention and the way uh, we cooperate and customs should cooperate with the environmental authorities to monitor uh, and enforce this multilateral environmental agreement. One of the last points on the on disruptive technologies, I said at the beginning that uh, the industry 4.0 offers some opportunities. And the WTO and WCO have cooperated together to uh, investigate more the role, the role of advanced technologies in cross-border trade. We have released a joint paper and then an updated version of the study report on disruptive technologies 2022 edition that you can find at the WCO website, where we see different uh, pilots that customs uh, are undertaking on blockchains and other technologies and ECs and other Internet of Things that have a role and will have a role in facilitating the way we control at the border and we release this burden that was mentioned from ICC introductory remark of monitoring uh, um, the, the, the flow of good at the border. Last point is on performance measurement. The WCO is launching the performance measurement mechanism to monitor and evaluate customs efficiency and effectiveness on all customs competencies trade facilitation, enforcement, security and protection of society, revenue collection, organizational development. We are measuring also the application of our tools and instrument, and we are measuring that also at the level of impact, connecting this to the sustainable development goals. It is a whole holistic framework where a uh, good point for us today in the webinar, we, are, we have two items, two expected outcomes that relate to paperless trade and increase effectiveness in fight against environmental threats that are, are going to be evaluated through this, through this framework. And in this way, we will be able to assess better the way customs is, is, is performing in this area. And we'll be able to assist customs administration better uh, to um, move towards the green transition. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have Thanks questions lot, again. In the yes, chat. Uh, correct in the chat. Um, thanks a lot, Valentina. Excellent presentation. And we, I would like now to move to. Um, sorry, can you lower? Can you lower the down? We will now move to a private sector perspective, um, which is from um, a, a huge global express com uh, career company, a very important stakeholder in the supply chain, global supply chain. And I'm happy that we have a presentation from Ms. Lara Furk. She's Senior Manager uh, Sustainability at DHL Express and the Global Head Office. So, Lara, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, actually, I handed over my slides to you, so I would ask you to please. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction, Christian. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening also from my side, from Bonn in Germany. It is a pleasure to be here. My presentation will be a bit off topic as it will not focus on paperless trade, but um, I will introduce our global sustainability strategy and give some examples for you how we as a global logistics company, um, being an important part of the supply chain, reduce our environmental footprint and help our customers to do the same. If you move uh, to the next slide, please. So as one of the biggest logistics companies in the world, we have intrinsic challenges when it comes to sustainability or ESG. Uh, we have a huge climate impact. Um, the Deutsche Post DHL group produced 39.4 million metric tons of CO2 emissions in 2021, which is the equivalent to the carbon emissions of the whole country of Portugal in the same year. 
And it is our responsibility to reduce our emissions in order to con contribute to stop climate change and also to meet the expectations of our, of our yeah, stakeholders, customers and partners. Um, and we are the 11th largest employer and thus have also an enormous social responsibility towards our almost 600,000 um, employees around the world and the communities that we operate in. That includes ensuring equal opportunities for our diverse workforce and safe working environment. Operating in um, more than 220 countries and territories worldwide leads to the responsibility of complying with many different legal standards and regulations and maintaining a safe global network. And this includes having world-class procedures, a code of conduct, supplier code of conduct, um, information security and data protection, human rights, anti-corruption, uh, competition compliance measures. And to ensure the awareness and a compliance mindset in our company, we have trainings for all our employees and relevant management positions um, for all of these uh, topics. And we also have a compliance management system in place. So if you move to the next slide, please. Um, our long-term goal is our mission 2050, so achieving net zero emissions by the year 2050. And our purpose, connecting people, improving lives, is the driving force in everything we do, and it is also valid for our sustainability roadmap. And to support our mission 2050 and having a more structured approach, we created a new sustainability roadmap in 2021 that will guide our efforts throughout the next years. Um, for this, we set three main commitments in the areas environment, social, and governance. What we call clean operations for climate protection, containing our decarbonization measures and targets, as well as, for example, um, the Deutsche Post DHL sustainable packaging principles and standards. Um, being a great company to work for all, including the development of a strong safety first culture, as well as a focus on DEIB, um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, and initiatives to attract and retain the talent. And being a highly trusted company means for us to have an effective governance set up in place that ensures um, compliance is an integral part of our daily business, and that the work and that we work together with um, only like-minded compliance suppliers and partners. Under each of uh, the commitments, you can see our key action areas and ambitions. Um, with our sustainability roadmap, we are putting them into a wider context to fully understand and leverage the role they play in being a sustainable company. And going forward, we will execute on these programs and initiatives much better um, with a clear purpose and with clear targets. With our four GO programs, Go Green, Go Trade, Go Help and Go Teach, we want to create a lasting impact in the communities that we operate in, supporting different volunteering activities and social projects, also engaging our employees in environmental activities and facilitating global trade and disaster response operations. Moving on to the next slide, please. Um, I will explain a little bit more about our measures to decarbonize DHL Express operations. Um, and we do that by focusing on five improvement areas. So as slightly more than 90% of our emissions come from aviation, our biggest opportunity to reduce them lies obviously within our aviation network. And um, our group's midterm target is to reduce GHG emissions to below 29 million tons of CO2 E in 2030 which is quite an effort um, with a growing transport business. So for the aviation area, we have several initiatives, and initiatives in place that will help us decarbonize um, our operations. So first of all, we will of course replace older airplanes with, the, with new ones that fulfill the high, um, yeah, highest efficiency standards as for example, the Boeing 777, with, uh, which is around 18% more efficient than older aircraft. Um, we also have a comprehensive fuel optimization program in place, um, and we want to burn less fuel for every ton that we fly um, by applying optimized standard flying procedures to increase the fuel efficiency. But our biggest lever in the aviation is undoubtedly sustainable aviation fuel or SAF, um, and our goal here is to achieve 30% um, of SAF blend by 2030. 
And in 2022, we signed uh, one of the biggest deals in the industry with BPN Nest to buy 800 million liters of SAF. And with this amount of SAF, we can save CO2 emissions to the equivalent of yearly emissions of 400,000 passenger cars or 12,000 flights from Cincinnati in the USA to Leipzig in Germany, where we have our biggest hubs. And uh, last but not least for the aviation um, sec area, we invested also in a new technology in Ellis, a fully cargo electric plane. And uh, yeah, this plane had, it, had its fir a first successful maiden flight in September last year. And we are very excited to have Ellis flying for us, flown for us in the US. Um, another important, important measure um, is the electrification of our ground operations, of our fleet. Um, here, our target is to electrify 60% uh, of our fleet by 2030. And uh, we work together with manufacturers in different regions um, in order to yeah, establish long-term partnerships. Then, of course, we want to construct carbon neutral buildings and facilities. So every facility um, should be carbon. Every new facility will be carbon neutral by default by applying um, default technologies and optional clean technologies, depending on the availability in the different areas and regions. Um, and yeah, of course, we, we will establish uh, the infrastructure for electric vehicles in all our facilities. But we will also retrofit our major hubs um, and gateways to become the carbon neutral, which is a big effort. Um, another important part for us is to um, engage our employees. And we do that with theoretical training on climate change and sustainability, and also um, engage them in environmental activities such as tree planting, beach and park cleanups, and trash bag challenges. Um, yeah, in order to increase the awareness around um, climate change. And last but not least, we are moving away from offsetting emissions outside our own value chain um, by investing in um, yeah, uh, offsetting projects, climate projects, um, to insetting our emissions, meaning that we reduce absolute emissions within our own operations and thus offer our customers the chance to reduce their scope three emissions. If you move to the next slide, please. Um, this is an overview of our fuel optimization program that I mentioned earlier and the 2021 results. Unfortunately, I cannot share yet the 2022 results. They will only be published um, on the 9th of March. Um, so in 2021, the program resulted in fuel savings of 11. million gallons or 43 million liters of fuel and thus 136 million kilograms of CO2e. And to put that into context, um, one tree can absorb on average 25 kilograms of CO2, uh, CO2 per year. So to reduce only 2.1% of our aviation emissions, um, we would need 8.4 million trees. However, it is not feasible and realistic to plant that many trees and um, there is simply not enough space to plant them effectively. And uh, also, did you know that trees need many years to become um, effective carbon absorbers? So um, anyway, it is much more effective to reduce absolute emissions and doing that in your own supply chain rather than offsetting emission reduction um, with tree planting or other projects outside your supply chain. And furthermore, we commit to the science-based target initiative and carbon credits purchased by our offsetting products are not considered as valid emission reduction. Moving to the last slide, please. Um, so more and more of our customers are also taking serious responsibility to make contribution to a sustainable world as they are setting sustainability goals. And it is our job to help them reach these goals. Um, that's why we offer a green alternative of our core product based on insetting. Um, we recently launched uh, this new service, uh, Go Green Plus it's called. And this allows our customers to reduce uh, CO2 emissions associated with their shipments through the purchase of sustainable aviation fuel. And the collaboration with the customer around Go Green Plus works as follows. The customer decides how much they would like to invest into ZAF via our Go Green Plus service. And um, yeah, we will then use the customer's contribution to invest into ZAF and only use it for ZAF purchasing. 
and an independent auditor will annually verify the emission reduction value of the purchased sustainable aviation fuel, as well as verifying all of the investment has been exclusively used for ZAF. So um, all uh, sustainable aviation fuel customers will receive a certificate with the emission reduction value, which can be used to reduce their own scope three footprint and contribute to their science-based targets or sustainability goals. And um, a complementary carbon footprint report will provide more transparency by detailing the customer's overall emissions with DHL Express. Yeah, so that was it from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, if you have any questions, please uh, yeah, let me know in the Q&A. Thanks a lot, Laura. Very interesting presentation. Actually, at, uh, during my time uh, with German Custom, I had the chance to visit for a month or to work uh, at the uh, big hub in Leipzig, and it was a very impressive experience. So um, this concludes our um, panel session, and we will now move to the next session, which is dedicated to case studies. This session will be moderated by uh, Florence Diorgay. She's Global Policy Lead, Trade Customs at the International Chamber of Commerce. And uh, over to you, Florence. Thank you, Christian. Um, and greetings from Paris, from the International Chamber of Commerce. Um, so now we're moving to the second part of our webinar in which we will learn a bit more about the, the, the practical part of um, the, the journey. And um, we will, so we will learn about how paperless trade can contribute to climate goals. And um, first, I would like to thank um, also the co-organizers for bringing us all together today and to you also for taking the time to be with us. So um, as Christian said, my name is Florence Binter Diaoge and I'm a global policy lead for trade and customs um, at the ICC. And um, yeah, I think we have, we all know ICC by now because we also had my colleague presenting. And so in the next session now, uh, we have three speakers and they will provide a very interesting angle to the topic. And um, we can get started right away with our first speaker, Mr. Luca Prunello, consultant at UNECE. And he has worked for the Boston Consulting Group on supply chain risk and sustainability as part of a global internal procurement transformation project. And before that, he has worked for an area of international clients on supply chain optimization and target operating models. Um, and this, I think, is a very important um, area because uh, through optimization and more efficiencies, we can already um, reach a lot of the targets. And um, he joined UNECE in October 2021 to work on um, a project to enhance tra traceability and transparency for sustainable and circular value chains and garment and footwear. So uh, Luca, the floor is yours. Oops, you're on mute. Hope we can't hear you, but it doesn't look like it's me. No. Maybe, do you have headphones you can use? Or check maybe the Zoom if you have uh, audio. So maybe um, because the, the time is a bit uh, tight. Okay, I'm gonna jump to the next speaker while you try to figure out what is going on. Um, <laughs> okay, um, so then let's move to our second speaker, <laughs> Mr. Ashraf Samsudin, who is deputy director of um, customs at the Consumer Protection Unit at Sri Lanka Customs. And Mr. Samsudin is a very experienced customs official who has worked in several divisions um, since he joined uh, Sri Lanka Customs in 1997. And now he is attached to the Consumer and Environment Protection Unit. And he's also a member of the ba Basel Technical Committee, the Basel, Stockholm, Rotterdam, and Minamata Enforcement Committee. So he brings a vast experience in investigation, prosecution, trade facilitation, and general administration. Thank you so much for being with us today. And um, so now the floor is yours. Mr. Zamsudin, we can't hear you. I don't know. Um, 
No, we can't hear you. Is there something going on with our Zoom? But you can hear me, right? Hmm. Maybe can you go on a mute and off mute again to try and try again? No. Hmm. Maybe. Ian speaking. I'm speaking before. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, I can hear you. So it's not the same. Before it's still okay. Something's happened. Yeah. Yeah, it's very strange that it's happening to two people. Maybe Luca, do you want to try again? I see you are back. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, so, fantastic. Samsudin, maybe we will try with Luca. So what did you do, Luca, to make it work? Uh, I did what I usually do, which is I close the window and open it again. <laughs> so nothing fancy. So okay. maybe, maybe, maybe because try we had that. the same problem. Uh, yeah. So then let's get started with your presentation. And Mr. Samsudin, if you wouldn't mind trying that <laughs> so we can hear you when Luca is finished. Uh, all right. Absolutely. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen. Let me know if you can see it. And thanks a lot, Florence, uh, for the introduction. Yes. Um, Good. Perfect. <laughs> I'll try to go a bit, a bit quicker, given that we lost a few minutes. Um, Thank you. So, um, uh, as, as Florence said, I work at the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, uh, and we have developed a um, framework initiative for enhancing traceability and transparency of uh, sustainable value chains in the garment and footwear industry. Uh, we started in 2019, uh, and... Um, I would say most of our work by now can be divided in two parts. Uh, the first part it's, uh, has more of a normative component. Um, we have developed um, uh, traceability and transparency standard and implementation guidelines. That includes uh, uh, business process analysis uh, for textile and leather, uh, business requirement specifications, and a data model, and also mapping of um, uh, legislation uh, around the world uh, on this topic, and also our policy recommendation and call to action. Um, this, these instruments were adopted um, by the UNC plenary in uh, April 2021. Uh, so you can find them online. Um, and this, yeah, so this was uh, mainly the first part uh, of our work, um, which is also apl uh, applicable at a at a high level, with a few changes to other industry, not just garment and footwear, uh, certainly in terms of uh, methodology and most parts of the data model. Uh, the second part of our work, which is um, more, um, uh, perhaps more related to this um, uh, second part of this, um, of, of this meeting, uh, it's the use cases and uh, pilots we have developed to implement uh, this standard. Um, so what we have done, uh, we have basically taken the standard and engaged with industry, certifying bodies, uh, universities, technology providers to track and trace um, basically finished product uh, to their source, so to the raw material, uh, so from farm to shelf. Um, we've, uh, uh, we have completed now 13 use cases. We are working on five new ones since uh, September. Uh, we started with cotton and leather value chain. Now we're moving to wool and uh, cellulose. <clears throat> and basically what, we've, what, what, what we have been doing, uh, starting from uh, uh, the business process analysis. So analyzing the type of, you can see it on the left hand box, type of processes involved in the value chain, uh, uh, the data model and the actors involved. Uh, we would take this um, framework and then tailor it uh, to the specific use cases and firms. Uh, we would look at the sustainability risks um, of, their supply, of their supply chain, um, obviously, you know, um, jet sea emissions and, uh, you know, climate impact is um, very specific to this conference, but there are others, biodiversity, uh, water pollution, labor and social risks that we look at. Um, and map it, uh, basically, these risks against different stages, different processes, which apply most. Uh, we have them mapped in our BPA. Uh, then, of course, they are um, tailored to specific cases. Um, and we basically have an um, implementation toolkit, um, which is basically our rules book for data management, 
um, presentations on on uh, uh, what I have just presented, but more in depth. Um, uh, data collection template, and then we have developed, uh, which uh, relates to the digital part, um, the blockchain platform, uh, together with uh, Swiss University, where the data that we collect uh, gets uploaded. Um, and the certificates they use to mitigate those risks get uh, registered. Uh, to do this, we have um, uh, in the um, in a second phase. Uh, so starting from last year, we have involved certifiers, certifying companies. So this is a this is a view of our platform. Uh, you can see the nodes of the supply chain, uh, and you can see here the type of risks covered for this specific use case. Um, so a red dot means that there is a risk which is not being addressed. A green dot means that there is a risk that has been addressed. A certificate has been uh, uh, declared by the uh, manufacturer or brand <clears throat> or wh wh whichever actor involved in that specific stage. It has been sent to, the, it has been automatically, uh, this, the, the certifier has been automatically notified uh, and have verified uh, that um, certificate and approved it. Um, so this is in a nutshell um, our 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 project, uh, what we are we've been working on um, uh, the whole team for um, uh, for a few years now. Um, just to make an example, this is a use case uh, that we are working on uh, at the moment uh, on a regenerative cotton for um, a jersey fabric T-shirt. We have um, raw material producers of so farmers in uh, in Turkey. Um, that have been uh, basically piloting um, just about the time when we started this project uh, at their own initiative uh, in, the, in the first place, um, regenerative agriculture practices, which cover uh, this type of risk on the left. So uh, less um, uh, pesticides, insecticides, lower water consumption, um, actually not lower GHC emission, but uh, absorption of uh, carbon into the soil. Um, and, and, and biodiversity uh, benefits. Uh, these are the type of certificates that they employ, uh, including uh, checks on labor and human rights and chemicals in the dyeing, uh, uh, weaving and spinning process. Um, what, is, um, what is it that we're doing in this um, new phase of uh, our pilots is also to uh, check different um, credentials from what we have done and also try to work with innovative technology. Uh, for example, um, in terms of regenerative agriculture, some of the claims they are make uh, the, 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 the farmer are uh, some of the techniques they're employing is, for example, no tillage, crop rotation, um, this kind of um, this kind of techniques. Of course, um, this is things you can check uh, with um, on site visits. But we are um, uh, working with, for example, a um, technology provider that it's working with the European Space Agency to use the satellites to basically check um, uh, these type of claims so they can go back in history and look from the satellite whether there was no tillage, no crop rotation, these kind of things. For biodiversity, we're in discussion with uh, environmental DNA provider that can um, basically uh, gather samples from the soil or water and see the delta between a regenerative field and a normal field or the delta over time for the same field um, and uh, how many species and uh, the uh, you know the richness uh, of the species in the area uh, these are just some examples of new technology we've been employing we've also been uh, and then i'll quickly conclude uh, um, for the physical tracing of the assets, we've been uh, working with uh, synthetic DNA providers that um, basically would spray the DNA just after the harvest on cotton. Uh, and um, then that cotton would be able to be read pretty much as a PCR test uh, throughout the different stages of production uh, globally, moving globally uh, across the nodes uh, to make sure it's the same cotton uh, coming from the farm and it's not been mixed with other, um, uh, other cottons uh, for which we, you cannot verify the credentials. Um, obviously, there is a cost element to all this that we are looking at. Um, 
probably most of these techniques can be used uh, as like sample checks rather than on the whole bulk material for cost reasons. But it's uh, it's very promising uh, so far, um, and we've published a proof of concept report uh, on these case studies, um, which you can also uh, find on our website. So thank you very much, and uh, Florence, back to you. Thank you, Luca. Very interesting, and I think it's really great also not to just rely on on the data and paper. So great to see that you have some other techniques also to 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 verify the, the claims. So let's try again with Mr. Samsudin. Uh, thank you for connecting again. Um... Hi, Florence. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Well, so the floor is yours. Okay. Do you have my slides with you? The team will put them up. Yeah. Shall I start my slides? I'm having with me. Um, no. Ah. I think we didn't receive your slides, um, but you should okay. be able to okay. share yes, I'll start. your screen. Okay. okay. Can you see my slides? It's coming up. Uh, yes, so maybe you can just put it in full screen and then we are good to go. Okay. Yes, perfect. Thank you. You can go for okay. it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, as you all know, all the customs administration all over the world are totally focusing on their revenue and uh, environmental matters are not that much prioritized in their vision and mission statement. However, in Sri Lanka custom, we have a mission where we include social and environmental protection and uh, facilitating the legitimate aid. It is in our vision uh, statement. As for that, we have established a department uh, a directed call consumer environmental protection directed in the custom department separately, especially delegated for environmental and protection matters. So when it comes to Sri Lanka, you know in every the policy will be generated by Minister of Finance and Minister of State. They make some And we lost him. I was just wondering if it was just me. I have no luck in my session today. What is happening? <laughs> um, yes, I, I think he will try to, to come back on, but um, maybe because we're already um, quite uh, late, we'll continue uh, with our third speaker, Ms. Mahizabin Natasha, who is consultant at um, UNSCAP. She has worked as consultant for several organizations, for example, the International Trade Center, and so more recently with the UNS Cup team. And um, she has helped, ah, he's back on, but I'm gonna continue just introducing um, Ms. Maya Zabin, and then, uh, then we can get back to your presentation. So she has helped develop a methodology to assess the environmental impact of the export process of the ready-made garment sector. So very fitting to our topic today. And uh, she has also done research on the seaport-based environmental footprint of trade procedures. And also um, she has worked and, I mean, developed a guide on um, climate smart trade procedures. And her background is in environmental and civil engineering. And um, today she will present on the environmental impacts of paperless trade and more specifically focus on the export process in Bangladesh 
um, for the textile and clothing sector. So maybe we try again with uh, Mr. Samsudin. Um, and uh, please, if you could try to be as fast as possible, and then uh, we can move to our last speaker after you. Can you put up your slides again? Yes. Is it visible to you? Um, it's, it's loading. Maybe it's the internet connection. It's a bit slow. We can't see it yet. Okay, and, and please, if you can be very, very brief, <laughs> that would be great. Thank you. Maybe, so, maybe. Um, you put it in full screen and uh, you have to go. Okay, okay, fine, fine, fine. Yeah, I just... Mr. Samsudin, you're, I think it's maybe your internet connection. So I'm wondering, it's really great to see you, but maybe you turn off your video. Okay, we lost him again. So so uh, let's go with our last presentation. Um, Natasha, the floor is yours, please. Um, let's hope you have more luck with your presentation. <laughs> the slides, if you... Um, Thank you, Thomas. So pull it up, yes. Okay, thank you, and uh, good morning from Geneva, Switzerland, and uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, let me share my screen. Is it okay? Can you all see the screen? Okay, great. Perfect. Um, yeah, so we all know that the relationship between trade facilitation and its environmental impact is not straightforward. Uh, trade facilitation obviously means increased trade, uh, more logistics, more paperwork, and also assessing the environmental impact is complex. It's a relatively new topic. Uh, however, uh, we can uh, work uh, towards the trade facilitation reforms in a way uh, that reduces the environmental impact to the extent possible. And uh, in this connection, SCAP conducted a study, which I'm going to present uh, now. Uh, it introduced a methodology on quantifying how paperless trade procedures uh, can potentially uh, benefit the environment and applied it in a case study in Bangladesh uh, textile and clothing sector. Um, and in the later phase, we also looked into the impact uh, coming from the trade logistics part of uh, government's export process um, at the Chittagong seaport in Bangladesh. So let's uh, uh, see the slide uh, to begin with the methodology of the study. Uh, we used a particular trade process analysis or a BPS study uh, to figure out all the trade activities in export or import transaction. Um, then as the next step, we linked uh, all the possible environmental aspects uh, with these activities, which determined uh, what to measure. And uh, finally, we quantified the environmental impact of paper-based trade procedures uh, in terms of these environmental aspects. Uh, for these, we validated and verified uh, the data collected uh, through the survey. Uh, we validated it through the uh, key informant interviews. And um, also, we identified the right environmental parameters, uh, set the assumptions, and most importantly, uh, use the most appropriate emission factor, which you can see marked red. Uh, because uh, emission factor is really very critical. It changes uh, with uh, geographical location, scope, and the activities. So um, it's critical to choose the most relevant one uh, for doing the calculation of the environmental impact. So moving on to the next slide, um, uh, the main environmental aspects that are linked with trade procedures. Uh, these are greenhouse gas emission, waste generation, and water usage. 
So now let's see um, what are the activities uh, identified uh, within the trade procedures and uh, their related environmental aspects. So the activities uh, within the trade processes in a paper-based trade process, uh, first of all, the usage of paper, almost uh, all the traders use a number of uh, main and supporting documents for each trade procedure, um, contributing to the greenhouse emission, waste generation, and water usage at the paper production phase. Um, also, a number of commutes uh, among the different stakeholders' offices for the submission and reception of the uh, different trade documents, uh, which um, causes the fuel combustion of the uh, document uh, transporting vehicles and ultimately contributing to the greenhouse gas emission. Also, um, for the goods storage, uh, for different kinds of goods, for example, for perishable goods, we use the cold storage, which uses uh, the HVAC system, heating, ventilation, and cooling system, uh, which adds up to the fugitive emission and also uh, higher energy consumption. Um, and then the office usage, almost all the stakeholders uh, use some kind of office space for doing the documentation work, uh, which um, uh, contributes to the energy usage, uh, office waste generation, and water consumption uh, in the work premises. And uh, finally, uh, we also looked uh, at the port um, due to the complexity in customs procedures. Uh, or paperwork or um, uh, you know, shortage of resources, it results into delays in loading or unloading the cargo, uh, which uh, causes long queue and idling of the goods transporting vehicles. Um, and uh, also um, the extra hoteling phase of the ships, uh, additional energy usage in the facilities or cargo handling equipments, all this leads uh, to the emission of greenhouse gas and uh, critical air contaminants into the atmosphere at the port. So moving on to the next slide, which shows the um, a result of our case study. So in our case study, uh, we quantified that uh, in a single paper-based export transaction, the greenhouse gas emission is 16 to 55 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent. Uh, the waste generation can be up to 400 kilograms and uh, the water usage can be uh, up to more than 100 liters uh, per transaction. You can see all the processes uh, in a single export transaction. Uh, which shows that um, the uh, uh, number 2.1, which is the importing of raw material, it costs uh, the highest environmental burden in all aspects because in the single um, uh, in the single step, the highest number of uh, papers are actually being used for the documentation purpose. Now, if we see the potential um, savings uh, from this impact, if we fully implement the paperless procedures. Um, from a high level estimation, we see that we not only potentially save the paper based greenhouse gas emission, but also we save the waste generation and water usage at the paper, at the paper production level. Also, um, we cut down the productive hours, thus uh, reduce the manpower and subsequent energy and uh, water consumption or waste generation in the workplaces as, as well. Thus, um, in a single transaction, going paperless has the potential to save a minimum of 16 kilograms of greenhouse gas emission, which can be translated as a one tree is equivalent to the savings uh, from one transaction. Also, um, uh, a minimum of 68 kilograms of waste can be less generated and uh, 29 to over 100 liters of water can be potentially saved uh, through uh, going paperless. Now, in this slide, uh, let's see what is the impact at the global level. So um, if we uh, scale up uh, the quantified amount at the global level, uh, assuming that uh, there are there is the same set of parameters and uh, it is in the same industry, I mean, in the textile industry, we can see that the greenhouse gas emission, uh, greenhouse gas savings uh, is equivalent to planting 7 to 23 million trees uh, in a year. Uh, similarly, the water saving is also uh, huge. Uh, the amount of water that can be saved uh, is equivalent to the water required to operate uh, 76 to 296 thousands of residential clothes washers annually. And um, also uh, in a year, 46 to 123 thousands of garbage uh, trucks of this can be less generated. 
So let's move into the next phase of our study, uh, which uh, we carried out uh, a high level study on the environmental impact uh, coming from the trade procedures uh, at the Chittagong seaport area and its vicinity. Uh, basically, um, in this study, we identified the multiple uh, sources of emission uh, that comes due to the uh, procedural delays. Uh, for example, uh, the idling uh, of the um, uh, goods uh, delivering uh, vehicles, uh, the longer operations of um, cargo handling equipments, um, the additional hoteling phase of the ships, um, which, um, uh, which uh, may contribute uh, to the environmental impact. And uh, from our high level estimation, we, uh, because it was a high level study, we did only uh, the estimation um, of the um, uh, air emission from the idling of the goods delivering uh, vehicles um, at the inland depots. And we see that it produces 11 to 24 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent um, uh, greenhouse gas. Um, only, it's only coming from the idling of the vehicles. If we uh, add this up with the emission from the production uh, to the port uh, that we just saw a few slides back, it accounts for 41% of the total greenhouse gas emission per export transaction. And uh, on top, uh, there are the criteria air contaminants, which are very important environmental aspects uh, for maritime sector. Uh, these are contaminants such as uh, carbon monoxide, hydrocarbons, and particulate matters. Uh, these uh, criteria air contaminants are also being emitted uh, from the idling of the vehicles. Uh, now, if you look into the annual air emission uh, coming from this idling of the vehicles, the amount is significant because uh, it shows that only in the textile export procedures in Chittagong Seaport in Bangladesh alone, it, um, it produces uh, 26 to 69,000 tons of greenhouse gas uh, in a year, which is equivalent to 0.8 to 2 million trees uh, required offsetting uh, such emission. So we can understand uh, the magnitude, uh, how it will be at the global level. Now, uh, finishing it off with the next steps, uh, basically towards achieving the climate goals, um, to uh, make it more meaningful and reliable, we need to measure because uh, if we do not measure, we don't know how to improve. And to measure, we need to have uh, the precise data to take action. So a comprehensive uh, primary research is needed uh, with multiple components using uh, multiple techniques. For example, the questionnaire surveys, uh, the key informant interviews and focus group discussion, uh, and uh, of course, with a good number of sample in the field. And um, also we need to uh, look into the different sources of emission that we identified in the phase two study, uh, but it has not been measured. So we need to see these sources of emission. We need to explore this. For example, the emission from the uh, extra hours of hoteling phase of the ships, locomotives, uh, uh, the extra hours of the operations of cargo handling equipment, energy consumption in the buildings and facilities and depots at the port um, that occurs um, uh, you know, for the uh, procedural delays uh, at the port. Uh, we, we also need to, uh, we can also see the um, environmental aspects, uh, for example, the waste electrical and electronic equipments, the fugitive emissions, um, how are they coming uh, from the um, procedural prospects. And uh, that's all from my side. Thank you. I'm sorry that it's a very, I mean, lot of information uh, in a very short span of time. Uh, the port analysis part has not been uh, published yet, but if you would like to know more about it, uh, please uh, reach out to us. Um, and yes, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. And um, it's, it's, it's really interesting. And because uh, it's so important also to be able to measure um, these kind of things, because if we can't measure it, we can we also cannot improve it. So thank you very much for for your great presentation. And um, I'm very sorry, Mr. Samsudin, because we're almost at time already. So I'm wondering if it would be okay with you if we could just post your presentation online. Um, and I'm very sorry. It's just we lost so much time. Um, How many minutes can you give me, Florence? Yes, now I can hear you. Okay, how many minutes can you give me? Can you because elevate? We, 
Yeah. Because we only have five minutes for the webinar. Okay. So I was I, going I to take it that time. No problem. Okay. 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 If we can do it in, in, very quickly and we can also share the slides afterwards. So don't, don't be worried. Uh, just okay. to skip okay. anything. So in the board of trade, there are a number of government and uh, non-government organization involved and number of documents involved. It is in all over the world, number of documents, number of organization, number of state sector organization uh, in uh, cross-border trade. So uh, all these uh, institutions get documents. The importers and exporters need to submit documents as well as need to physically present to them and present their goods even or sample a lot of procedures. So all these are regulatory organization as well in other way. What custom did in Sri Lanka was, we have started our paperless document process. We are now expecting uh, and the uh, scan documents and the importers and exporters are producing scan documents. We don't need any paper documents. Other one is the importers and exporters can directly input their data into our custom system that is called direct trade input. And we have established an e-payment system with the bank and also e-remittance with the bank. So you no need of coming to customs or submitting any documents. Totally, we have connected all of them into our computer system, which is a Sekuda world. We have electronic submission of manifest. All the vessels need to submit manifest. Sometimes there are four copies. In one month, most probably we will collect more than a 40 foot container load of manifest in our department. At the moment, it is zero because of electronic submission of manifest. And as well, we are giving an electronic cargo clearance e-release. We don't need to submit any document to a uh, ports authority or airport. We just pass it through the electronic system. The goods will be released from there. And we have moved to digital signature now and still the legislation had to be give uh, approval for the same, but still we are using the digital signature for certain companies. They don't need to submit any paper document. And also we are established the integration of other government agencies into the custom system where the importers and exporters need not to go to each and every organization. They need to just submit the documents through e-system and all the documents will be collected by custom into the Asikuda system. We are not in a position to effort for a single window concept, but we have started the ASICUDA system with integrated government agencies. And the ASIAB is in operation still with the Antarctic and German fund. Very soon we'll come with the ASIAB. So we have so far connected Sri Lanka Tea Board, Food Control Authority, Coconut Development, Department of Excise, Department of Inland Revenue, Department of Motor Traffic, and all the state sector organization into custom system. And we don't need any paper documents at the moment. Just they need to contact to that particular organization or a government department and submit their document through an e-system. And the same will be reflect in the Asikuda World System of Sri Lanka Custom. We give clearance through e-documents, we don't go through the paper document. So in border control, documents are very much needed. Regulatory environment, we have to enforce laws. At the same time, we need to see for the evidence of papers and clearance and certificate. But at the moment, due to the Asikuda system, we are getting the scan copy. We are getting, getting the input from the importers and exporters as well from the other government agencies to our Asikuda system, and we are giving our clearance through our system. This way of, we are forwarding. Furthermore, very soon there will be a ICT Act passed in the parliament. After that, total digital signature will be accepted all over Sri Lanka. So we have converted most of our activities to e-procurement and e-system. Thank you. Incredible. You managed uh, to do it so quickly. Thank you very much uh, for this great presentation. And um, so we have for one minute left. I'm going to hand it over because it's a bit tight for there, there were no real questions, just some praise for, for our speakers. So thank you very much. And um, thank you for being with us today. I will pass it on to Armin um, for the closing. Okay, okay, thank you very much. I guess we don't have uh, time for Q&A, but uh, maybe maybe we can try still <laughs> to have a couple of questions if uh, participants are 
uh, interested. Uh, I would like just to address a couple of questions to the uh, to the maybe one or two speakers, uh, starting with Jan Watt from UNC Fact, and I would like to address uh, the following aspect. Uh, we have heard about the different activities of UNC Fact and the standards in uh, development within UNC Facts, which are actually a global standards recognized uh, in all regions around the world, and they are used also uh, within the EU or other uh, international, let's say, uh, uh, sovereign national organizations. And I would like to just know if there are any uh, ways how UNCFAC is monitoring the implementation of those standards, how actually they support the implementation of those standards, if they have any uh, activities that they can share, how we are actually following up on the implementation of those standards. This is one question that I would like to raise uh, to Jan Watt and raise another question and uh, to another speaker and uh, I, can, uh, I can close on my side. Uh, another question I would like just to raise to Lara from DHL. Uh, uh, I would like just to also have a similar question to you. Uh, we understand that you mentioned several aspects and those activities you are mentioning, uh, like electrifying ground operations and uh, uh, deploying electronic planes. So it's amazing to know about uh, cargo using electronic planes, and uh, we know that the air transportation has a huge impact on the uh, environmental aspects. And we would like to know if uh, you have a kind of alignment with UN SDGs, with Basel Convention, if uh, you are looking to how to align with those uh, uh, standards, international agreements, and if uh, you have any coordinated activities with international developing partners uh, such as UN or any other international organization. Uh, this is the two questions that I wanted to raise. And uh, please, uh, briefly, if you can provide any clarification and alignment on those aspects. And after we will go with the closing if uh, uh, Christian or Florence do not have anything to add on it. Thank you. I mean, Ian speaking, yes. Um, that question on how much use, that is a question that the Secretariat and the Bureau struggles with. I showed you early on that in the point that um, the work that the ICC and co have done with the public, public bodies and then the private, what we do know is that many of the private bodies use UNC FACT standards and therefore they're deployed through that. For instance, GS1 uses about 40 of the full set of the EDIFAC messages and that's what's in EAN.com. And they're very successful with that. So CFAC standards are usually implemented through one of the private sector bodies, bringing them through and putting them through to their communities and their various industry sectors. But it's a very challenging question that CFAC and the Secretariat are addressing to try and understand how is that being. That was more easy with EDIFACT because we had, uh, you know, there's a lot more there. But uh, yeah, that's a very question that we're trying to get an answer of. But we know it's happening out through the private sector deployment bodies. I hope that addresses the question. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Yes, of course, it, that is the question. I mean, uh, it's always useful when uh, you are working any international organization uh, developing any standards, it's always useful to be able to monitor the implementation and to have the uh, actually, the actual impact of those standards uh, implementation on the on the uh, challenges that we are facing. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, now I just give floor to Lara. Yeah, many thanks for the question, uh, Armin. So yes, we do uh, align with the um, SDGs. So we have picked out seven that we actively can support with our measures. Um, but of course, we we support the whole um, SDGs, all the SDGs, um, and we also. Um, align our measures for, for example, the human rights with the UN Global Compact. Um, and we uh, have our, our um, greenhouse gas emission targets, we have that aligned um, or verified by the science-based target initiative. So in fact, we have a huge list of or international organizations like the First Mover Coalition and other um, UN um, projects that I now don't know by heart because it's actually a lot. And we have a, a web page um, and a public web page where we list all the, the projects and initiatives from different international organizations that we support and partner up with. So yes, definitely. 
I hope that answers the question as well. Very well. I don't see Armin anymore. Are you still here? No, maybe not. So maybe I take over and say yes, big thank so, you to all the. Ah, you're back. Okay. Yes, I'll sorry, give the floor sorry, to you. I, have, <laughs> I mean, uh, I would like just to highlight the aspect that we are talking here about how actually uh, also the technology can help us to uh, improve the overall uh, activities and impact positively on the environmental goals. But we we see that actually the technology also has its own limits and challenges. And this is what happens right now to me. Now I'm <laughs> with the laptop of Christian doing this closing. Yes, uh, thank you very much for all the excellent uh, experts. Uh, thank you very much for your time joining us. And thank you, of course, to all participants. I mean, uh, just to mention a couple of words about the closing, we have heard about the different aspects, what what uh, different international organizations and also private and public sector are doing in their own areas, how they support the implementation of different standards uh, to impact positively the environmental challenges that we are facing. Now this, those uh, challenges are becoming more and more evident and it means, as uh, I think one of the speakers mentions, uh, right now what we are doing, it seems that we are not doing enough. Uh, so we need to do more. We need to do, be engaged and uh, uh, we need to coordinate and cooperate more within the public, private and international developing partners uh, to have more impact on, on uh, uh, addressing those challenges. And we have heard from the WCO that we are already having a, a green customs uh, policy or let's say program that we are developing. We have heard what it means for the WCO and for the customs administrations. We have heard that uh, uh, actually uh, the technology aspects of uh, the industry uh, 3.0 or 4.0 is going also to help and facilitate further uh, to uh, go paperless, which is going to impart, impact and help the overall uh, uh, environment aspects. We have heard uh, a lot of uh, UNSC activities, standards uh, for the data collection, blockchain platform, which is, of course, all of those uh, comprehensively are going to have a great impact, uh, hopefully near future on those aspects. So uh, I would like to say thank you again to every uh, uh, speaker and every participant that have uh, shared their expertise on the aspects that we were do, uh, discussing. And thank you and see you to the next. Uh, right now, we have not decided exactly the next webinar, but most probably it will be uh, May uh, 10, uh, 10 to 12, and it will be within the UNC FACT Forum uh, in, the, in the upcoming forum in May. Uh, we will further communicate the uh, date and the topic that we are going to discuss. And thank you, everyone, for following us uh, so far for this successful series of the webinars. Thank you very much. And uh, by which I am closing the uh, webinars. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thank Evening, you. afternoon, morning. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.